Oh yes, it's the last month of 2018. You know what that means? Another flurry of worst music of the year lists from self-proclaimed pop culture commentators on the internet. By doing a list of my own, it seems that I'm now ends with the group, so hopefully we can all go out and play air hockey together. I'm very excited to be talking about albums that really succeeded in what they do, but before that happens, I'm going to have to scold a few for misbehaving. I don't always go out of my way to listen to bad music, so while I try not to pick anything controversial for this video, this list will only feature albums that I bothered to listen to in full. So the fascist stoner metal band camp, the angry white boy with braids and the demo scraps of hip-hop's favorite woman beater won't be given much spotlight, and I'm sure that this disappoints absolutely nobody. Billy Corgan looking a little bit like a base design for a boss fight in Snowy the Bear's Adventures for the PC, teamed back up with the Smashing Pumpkins and are seemingly still able to release material, only this time none of it good at all. The alternative rock icons decide to throw strings onto these milk toast rock songs written like they played a game of Mad Libs and called it a day, but the big offender is the production, it's not even mixed properly and I wouldn't have minded nearly as much if it were a band finding the ground on their own, but this is literally the Smashing Pumpkins. It sounds nitpicky that of all things I'd be criticising the mixing, but that's the thing, it has to be woeful if it's that noticeable above the sound of Corgan's voice sounding like a gremlin eating kimchi, said voice drowns in a whirlwind of orchestral mash, and the guitars are riddled with bullet wounds from their service during the loudness wars. It was produced so carelessly, and nearly felt tempted to make a joke about how Rick Rubin may as well have been involved, but those are old punchlines, and it's not even fair considering he wasn't even involved. Oh hang on a minute, culprit, we've got him fellas. The There seems to be a notable market for strumming a ukulele to tried and true chord progressions, then writing a twee pop song and then plastering strings and tambourines over the top to make it sound cute and very easy to cover. It's called music for mobile data plan commercials, or as I'd like to formally address them, Vance Joy. Although their hit song Riptide is a neat contender for the victor in the contest of pick up a ukulele and write the dullest possible song that you can with it competition, I can see why it stirred up a lot of passive love, because it's very easy to like. It straddles the barest standards for it to even be considered a song, so I can see why the new album Nation of Two might strike a chord with listeners, mainly because the chords that they strike are generally agreed upon as being the nice ones to listen to. But when you milk that for 13 tracks, I start to get a little bit suspicious. Nation of Two isn't offensively bad, in fact it's more inoffensively bad than anything else. Sticking to the same formula of strings and folk instrumentation is a safe port of call, but it's so sanitised and lacking that it cleans up any chance of finding a string of human connection here, cementing over any smidge of emotional honesty that they might have wanted to keep. It's like trying to satisfy your umami taste buds by licking a breeze block. Better to say yes to never For as much as you could wince listening to a 30 Seconds to Mars song, they would have at least aimed to sound huge and epic, and even if these attempts to sound huge and epic might end up reaching the same heights as a punctured bottle rocket propelled into the air by the breathy squeals of a mating turtle, I didn't find them horrendous is what I'm saying, just melodramatic to a fault, although that fault may as well have been the San Andreas fault. In futile attempts to be topical and create a sparkling social commentary on this year's parodious episode of the United States, 30 Seconds to Mars decided to call their new album America, and it suits well because like America, it's nowhere near as impressive as it thinks it is. Throw this one on the pile of rinse and repeat commentary alongside a shift towards a mainstream electropop sound to get big radio plays. You could congratulate them for giving this social consciousness a go, but I won't, because whatever attempt there was to address anything topical is so vague that it renders the entire aesthetic completely purposeless, choosing mainly to stumble back into the isolated bedroom of vaguely angsty phrases that XXXTentacion might have scribbled on the back of his diary. All of that said, the most offensive thing this album did was let Jared Leto near a microphone again. Perhaps you could get a laugh out of the the online generator that allows you to create your own personalised variations of the cover artwork, and while I'm sure that virality played into their hands, I certainly had a lot of fun making them, so there is something there. I mean, I still won't re-listen to the album, and I won't talk about it again, but at least I have four extra JPEG files on my computer. A look, ay, I'm a boss bitter, I'm a hard hitter, yeah I'm light skinned but I'm still a dark nigga. To be honest, I don't like complaining about Drake. The problem is that I'm not a fan of Drake either, and too much so to want to stop complaining about Drake when the time is right for me to complain about Drake, so now it's time for me to complain about Drake. I don't think everything on Scorpion is bad. In fact, I'd like to think that there are at least four impressive songs on here, but if I said that about an album with 10 songs, I wouldn't have even bothered here. The thing is that Scorpion is an album with 25. 25 songs from an artist who already has trouble trying to make 10 of them worth a 
another listen. If we have two sleepy discs, one full of dreary rambling and the other one packed with mediocre pop, I may as well have spent the 90 minutes listening to backgammon tutorials and Tory Lanes. While each Drake album has had different narratives that it was aiming for, while it didn't always nail the target, the stream of piss at least had the courtesy of hitting the urinal, while Scorpion seems completely unaware of where it's heading, and sprays in completely unexpected directions, soaking the floor and later slipping on the leftover puddle of confessional wee. It's got to be unfortunate for Drake in a post story of added on planet earth, I mean at the end of the day he's still the best selling artist in the world, I don't think his career is over at all, but it certainly shook this album here, because playing those diss track games got his rocky relationship with his son and said son's mother, family connections, favourite colour, postcode, grocery store membership ID, desktop wallpaper, and favourite honey oat biscuit recipe thrust into the eye of public scrutiny like some kind of a tabloid ready cum shot, which probably threw the man off in the midst of making this album, as he spends half of it trying to clear up what was going on, not realising that explaining something as hefty as this probably goes a bit beyond writing verses about Georgia Smith and channeling a hissy fit at having to pay child support, all on an album where the most memorable result from it was the soundtrack for a viral challenge about crumping next to a moving vehicle. I don't like the new Fallout Boy album, isn't that a hot take? I could continue this segment of the video whipping out snarky quips like Fallout Boy, more like Fall Off Boy, and then go celebrate my rapier wit by raising a toast with a jug of my own spunk. But instead, I'll actually reiterate what makes Mania a bit woeful. I mean, it starts out alright, maybe a bit glossy, but nonetheless what we might expect from a pop band, let alone one with a very grating vocalist. The further that you go, however, the more you realise that their efforts are soaked in overblown post-production, and embody attempts to embrace musical pop styles that are so far outside of their zone of strength, it cuts off any potential for them to reconsider the direction, before you're hearing a reggae fusion followed by the John Bellion equivalent of a dubstep drop. What baffles me is that the aftermath of many delays for this album still ended up being 35 minutes long, and sounded rushedly slopped together like Mark Corrigan's Moroccan pasta bake in the final season of Peep Show. Truthfully, I would have liked to like this album. Lil Xan is usually one of the go-tos when it comes to generalising hip-hop as a fallen art with no meaning, and how epic would it have been for me to rise above that and say, you know what, this album's actually pretty good, but that becomes very difficult to do when the music itself is actually not good at all, mostly warranting a lot of the criticism it's had flung at it like mushy tomatoes from the old head's compost bin. So I'll give you that one, guys. Total Xanarchy is completely lacking in character, charisma, and even the kind of energy it needs to stay awake. Usually a debut album showcases the talent of an artist, but the tracks that I can call the best ones on this album are because of other people. A Diplo instrumental and a remix of Betrayed with two extra verses from different people. So you can really get a neat scope of how inessential Zan's contributions are to his own music. Tom Morello gets around a lot, and no, that's not the name of an expensive ice cream brand, he's the guitarist for Rage Against Machine and Audio Slave, which I'm sure you may recognise as bands in the realms of rock and metal. Rock is back, baby! However, his latest album here isn't a rock record. I mean, it has guitars and a lot of those hefty metal riffs chugging around, but if you see Knife Party, Steve Aoki and Pretty Lights on the billing, you might begin to think there's something else going on. Then you look around and see, hold on, is that Tim McElrath from Rise Against? Like Kelly 47 and Vic Mensa? Big Boy and Killer Mike, Jizza and Rizza, Portugal the Man, Marcus from Mumford and Sons? The Atlas Underground is a DJ Khaled album sculpted from the grounds of a Bonnaroo lineup. It's the crossing paths between EDM, rock and hip hop, and it stumbles often while trying to be anthemic and stirring. It's confident, I'll give it that, but you can be confident about anything really. I suppose the upside is that the message it's handing out isn't really a harmful one, it's just that the delivery is so ham-fisted, taking this ham and shaking it in your face, chanting we've got the ham, yes we do, yes we do. This has to be the most tragic thing that Carnage's ghost producers have made yet. How does this still sound phoned in? It has to be the most baffling set of EDM and hip hop crossovers that I've heard yet. Aside from one excellent single featuring Made in Tokyo and Mac Miller, plus a surprisingly excellent raving banger from both Carnage and Lil Pump, Battered, Bloody and Bruised doesn't redeem itself much elsewhere, which is a bit ridiculous considering the billing of featured artists. Is it a compensation for how little of a distinctive production style Carnage has this many years into his career? There's more personality in royalty free vlogging music, or Vance joy as I like to call it. You better stop it, see me falling off is not an option. I see you plotting, trying to wonder how we got this popping. Perhaps the most tiring trend on social media to have seen in the past few years, aside from Everwing and Big Fish requests on Facebook, was fast food chains starting to sass up their Twitter profiles, firing out quirky and sardonic punchlines in an attempt to look extremely cool. 
wait a second, as companies channel their entire marketing team behind this one account and your fantasies of flirting with a Wendy's girl is turning out to probably be the world's most ambitious catfish case. I suppose I see the fun in having loose yarns with the same fast food mascots that serve your cousin the same crusty sludge that they call chicken nuggets. But maybe I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it if half of the attempts weren't so remarkably lame. Wendy's is the sassiest case of caustic social media personalities, trying to pander towards anything that'll get people talking about them, which is why the idea of a Wendy's hip-hop mixtape called We Beefin makes me want to pop a Manu into a deep fat fryer. To be honest, whoever is at the mic is a competent rapper and the album is produced to an okay standard. Also, this mixtape is like really really funny. Like there's food puns which are really really funny. There are disses towards other fast food chains which is really, really funny. You bet they could make more burgers from all the dead horses that they're beating, but Ricky, is this really worse than 30 Seconds to Mars and Little Xan? Maybe not technically, but it's irritated me enough to seem like it, so I'm going to be a grumpy bitch anyways. By the way, Wendy's, have you sorted out those tomatoes yet? Make no mistake, this album made me want to form this formation with my hands, take my middle and ring fingers, and stick them into my mouth as far as I could until they hit the back of my throat. Youngblood's 21st century liability is easily the most tasteless aesthetic I've seen for a pop album this year. It pretends to grasp an understanding of societal issues, especially those surrounding mental health disorders, but then somehow manages to completely disrespect the discussion for its predominantly young teenage audience by making a complete airheaded spectacle of it, by pretending that these things are very entertaining notions worth making jokes about, going on about how he and another generation of kids feel completely psychotic. I don't know if I'd have minded it as much if it was some kind of edgy shock band trying to do whatever they could to provoke some disgust in the listener, but Youngblood seems totally convinced that he's some kind of a messenger of important values, and it gradually begins to feel less like he's laughing through the pain and more as if he's laughing at it. Perhaps I should have looked at this with a more charitable lens, but I have no clue if he deserves that with a delivery this clumsy. It's genuinely the worst thing that I bothered to listen to this year. This and that really long Eminem freestyle, but that's a different story for another day. So all the boys there. <laughs>